There's this popular idea that everything happens for a reason. It's just not true, and it's actually entirely unhelpful. Diana Butler Bass rightly says that not everything happens for a reason, but then she qualifies it and says, but everything that happens matters. In other words, how we respond, how we react, or how we see the events of everyday life, those moments matter. So you may have been with us. This is our third week looking at the story of Naaman. I won't repeat it now, but simply to say the point we're at in the story is that Naaman has been miraculously healed of his leprosy. And this once proud, angry man has now been humbled by the outrageous grace of God. And he goes to Elisha and he wants to say thank you. He's full of gratitude. And the only way he knows how to say thank you is to offer Elisha money because he has lots of it. But Elisha will have none of it. Naaman, though, because he's a person of authority and power, he, he urges, he, he imposes upon Elisha to take the monetary gift because he's so grateful. But Elisha is very clear, he's adamant, he doesn't want any money because God is not for sale. Everything that happens matters. And then it's as if Naaman, in that moment, gets it. Like he entirely understands what's going on. He, it seems like he gets what Elisha's going on about. Because he makes this very unusual request. He asks to take two large bags of soil home with him. Which is unusual. Something, something which costs nothing, but seems to Naaman to mean everything. And, and he wants to take these things home with him because he wants to remain connected to the place, to the God who has saved him. He wants to remain connected to the place and to the God who has healed him. Everything that happens matters. Meanwhile, further on in the story, Elisha has a servant, Gehazi. And Gehazi can't believe that Naaman, an Aramean, that's the important bit, he's a foreigner, that, that Naaman gets healed from an incurable disease on Israelite soil by Israel's God, and he pays nothing for it. It's just given to him. And in that moment, Gehazi sees an opportunity. Everything that happens matters. So Gehazi chases after Naaman, catches up with him, and then when he gets there, he makes up a story. He says, ah, oh, unexpectedly some visitors have arrived to visit the prophet. And he asks Naaman for a talent of silver and two sets of clothes. Now there's a little bit of debate about the exact value of a talent, but we do know it was a hang of a lot of money, a large amount of money. And the most common description that I find helpful is that a talent was apparently equal to one year's wages for a laborer. So in other words, it would take someone a whole year to earn this amount of money. It might in fact have been Gehazi's annual salary. And Gehazi wants one of those from Naaman. And now Naaman's heart, filled with gratitude and praise for all the goodness that has happened to him, instead of giving Gehazi one talent, gives him two. So Gehazi takes the money, smuggles the money back into the village, and then goes on to see Elisha. And Elisha says to him, where, where have you been? And Gehazi says, nowhere. And then Elisha says, and by the way, this is the risk of working for a prophet. Uh, Elisha says, well, was not my spirit with you? In other words, was I not with you in the spirit realm, as it were? Was not my spirit with you when the man got down from his chariot to meet you? Is this the time to take money or to accept clothes? And we kind of think that that's the deal. But then, much to our shock as readers, as listeners, we suddenly discover uh, Elisha goes on, he says, or olive groves and vineyards or flocks and herds or male and female slaves. It turns out Gazi is a Gupta. And so Elisha then goes on, and this is the most difficult part of the whole chapter. He says, Naaman's leprosy, Naaman's leprosy will cling to you and to your descendants forever. Not anyone, else, not just any leprosy, not just leprosy, but Naaman's leprosy will cling to you. Then Gehazi went from Elisha's presence and his skin was leprous. It had become as white as snow. It's a very unsettling end to our story. Greedy Gehazi ends up with an almost inconceivable judgment 
because this judgment is not only on his life, but it ends up being on the life of his family. There's leprosy for him and for his family for generations to come. And we've been in the story for a few weeks, so I've been living with the severity of Gehazi's judgment for the last few weeks and thinking about it. And I think the most helpful way for us to face it is to say, if we can take ourselves away from the literalism of the story, which is wise often, by the way, in the Bible, and not get caught up in all the, the details, and not that they're unimportant, but for the moment, not get caught up in all the details, but to try to see the bigger picture, then we will discover a quite remarkable story here from which we can learn. So I wanted us to do a bit of that together. So let's, let's notice here that Gehazi's crimes are not insignificant. Gehazi's crimes are not insignificant because everything that happens matters. His crimes begin with this mix of xenophobia and greed. It's really the xenophobia that, that triggers him at first. Because his big burning issue is how can a foreigner find blessing in our land without paying for it? And this, of course, has been the very same question at the center of the xenophobic violence here in South Africa. How dare a foreigner find blessing in our land? And we hear the same concerns across the world today. How dare a foreigner find blessing in our land? Ghazi also goes on, we, we hear, to do what millions and millions and millions would end up doing after him. He ends up putting a price on God. He puts God up for sale. In this instance, it's one talent and two sets of clothes. Judas, we'll remember, did it for 30 pieces of silver. And I want to say that none of us, and if I can use this phrase, and I mean it deliber deliberately, none of us who are in the God business are free of this temptation. Even as now, post-COVID, we fight to keep our institutions alive. It's tempting. It's tempting to put a price on God's head. In addition to these things, Gauz, he also turns out to be a lying con man. He is the ancient world's Tinder swindler, the guy who keeps emailing, phoning, or SMSing you to tell you you've inherited or won a fortune. He's the workman who takes your deposit and never shows up to do the work. He's all of these things rolled into one. He's a lying con man. And Gauzy was the Bernie Madoff of his day. If you don't know that name, it's the whole Ponzi scheme thing. We don't know the details exactly of how um, Gehazi did these things, but it's clear from what Elisha says is that he conned people out of olive groves and vineyards, out of flocks and herds. He robbed people of their livelihoods. He robbed them of their futures. He robbed them, in our language today, he robbed them of their pensions. And he was also uh, an underhanded black market slave trader of male and female slaves. The fact that the scriptures bother to tell us that they were male and female slaves leaves me to wonder whether rape and sexual abuse might also have been on Gehazi's rap sheet. And then through it all, because of it all, this behavior has betrayed the trust of his master. And that betrayal of trust has now not harmed not only himself, but has brought great harm to his family as well. So Gehazi's life leaves behind him this unimaginable trail of destruction because everything that happens matters. And the leprosy he contracts ends up being a reminder. This is where we need our imaginations a little. The leprosy he contracts is really a reminder that the consequences of his crimes, like the judgment that ends up on his own body, have an enduring and devastating impact, not only on him, but perhaps especially so on the people that he has abused and robbed and lied to and conned and traded as commodities over the years. His leprosy is, if nothing else, a metaphor for the consequences of his choices. This is really quite a remarkable story. Because it reveals for us how in just one brief moment, one brief moment, Gehazi decides to chase after Naaman and try and extract some money out of him. And with that single action, Gehazi's life was changed forever. Everything that happens matters. But our story has another little cameo as well. 
It's about Naaman and his two bags of soil. And I find it to be like this wonderfully strange trade-off. You know, he's going, he says to Elijah, if I can't give you money to say thank you for my healing, which, he's really, which he really feels deeply, his alternative is, he says, well, if, if you won't take my money, can I ask you a favor? And the favor is, can I take home just two bags of soil with me? It's just, it's like this weird trade-off. But, but I think I understand what he's doing. Because Naaman knows that when he gets home, part of his duties are going to be to walk into the temple of the God from there. And he's going to have to bow down to this other God. And he's, he's wanting to make sure, he's, he's pre-planning, he's wanting to go, I don't want to be misunderstood. I don't want my loyalty to this God who has cleansed me from this terrible disease to be questioned. I am so grateful for this God. I want to remain connected. I want to keep even a physical connection to this God who has healed me. I want to I want to still be able to stand on the soil on which I was saved. I want to stick to my roots of my salvation. It's just a beautiful, beautiful picture of a man who knows where he belongs, who, who knows where his ground is, where he needs to stand. It's such a beautiful alternative to the life of Gehazi. And the reality is that life is never neat. I mean, why are we surprised when, why are we still surprised, I say this for myself, when terrible things happen in our world? Why are we surprised when the world falls apart, when our country feels like it's under threat? Why are we surprised when tragedy happens? The reality is we live in a world of Gehazi's. Uh, we live in a world in which people make foolish decisions and choices and where everything that happens matters and we don't always do that well. But we also live not only in that world, we also live in a world where there are Naamans, where there are people who know their solid ground, who are connected to goodness, who stand on goodness. And the reality is that in all of us there is a Gehazi and there is a Naaman. And I think it simply boils down to how we respond to what happens in life. How we respond matters. So Naaman knew that when he returned home, he knew that his faith would be under some kind of threat. He knew he was going back into an environment where he was not the same man that had left. He was different in all kinds of ways. And he had the foresight to go, I need two bags of soil. I need I need these symbols of my salvation. I need solid ground to stand on in my mad, mad world. Because I know that everything that happens matters. And I know that how I respond to what happens to me when I get home will matter. So I'm taking my two bags of soil, the symbol, the symbol of goodness, the symbol of healing, the symbol of love, the symbol of grace, and I'm going to stand on that. My friends, we are we are all people, um, at one time or another, I think, who have been wounded by the Gehazis, and we are people who have wounded. And so today I want to just simply pause for a moment and invite you to pray with me as we close. Come, let's pray. So Lord, we stand before you today deeply conscious that many of us listening today uh, have deep wounds from the Gehazis in our life. And we also stand before you today as we seek to be honest to go and we have behaved in ways in which we have wounded others. And we pray today that you would help us find the same healing that belonged to Naaman, the same grace that came to him. We don't pretend that these wounds are quick and simple to heal. We know they are deep and big. But we do want to, on this day, we just simply want to stand before you. We want to affirm before you today that like Naaman, we, we want to take our two bags of soil. And we want to affirm that in our mad, mad world, that you are our solid ground you are our place of grace. You are our place of healing. You are our place of hope. We don't expect quick or trite or simple answers to this, but we do know that you are there. And so won't you help us as we seek healing, as we try to bring healing, 
as we try to receive healing. Lord, let be our solid ground, we pray, through Christ our Lord. Amen.